Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, General Cody, for that introduction. It, it, it really was not a eulogy, thank you. Uh, General P, thank you for being here. General Smith, thank you for inviting me. It's, it's really an honor. Um, I was not one of you all top performers when I was a cadet, I will say. So it, when I say it's an honor to speak to you, it really is. You know, I was kind of determined to have some fun in college, and uh, it was fun, even at West Point. Um, <laughs> it was. I made it fun. Uh, but good for you. Congratulations. It's quite an honor. As a matter of fact, my, my uh, counterpart, who is a senior executive service, which is the civilian side, uh, general officer equivalent in the building, the Pentagon, on the civilian side, and he said, I was one of them. It's a great time. This, this whole seminar is a fantastic weekend, and I hope it has been for you. But he also warned me that you got here last night and probably had a big party and people would be falling asleep. So <laughs> that's okay. Um, General Smith told me that, um, that really, you know, it's usually four stars who speak here. And I thought, oh my goodness, I am the replacement for a four star general. He said, well, no, not exactly. I said, oh, okay, okay. But, but you know, um, I was asked to do this because, as General Cody said, my position right now is at the center of strategy, at, at what we call an inflection point um, for the Army. Um, and, it, and it really is. The challenges are huge. I mean, I think you heard this morning from General Cody about the post-Vietnam era. Um, probably not quite that bad, so no worries. Um, but but there is, it is certainly an inflection point, and I'm really lucky to be there. But I, you know, I was also told that I was asked to do this because I'm actually closer to your age. So <laughs> I said, right, right, that's what they're going to think. Yeah, one old person is just like another old person. But my kids are not your age yet. I want to make that clear. I have four sons, and they're still young. So, okay. So I'm going to talk to you today a bit about the operational environment, um, a little bit about how we're shaping the Army to meet the challenges of that operational environment, um, and as well as what I think is your role and your obligations in that Army that you're about to enter. Um, you know, we like to call this thing, I'm going to talk in two dimensions. So one is, uh, is the, you know, the, the, the world, the operating, when you go out to the, uh, the combatant commands um, and you operate in their theaters, what, what might you be faced with? But the other dimension of the environment is very much fiscal right now. And I don't want to scare you, and it's not all you know, gloom and doom, um, but it is fiscal, and, it, you, and just a few things you might want to be aware of as, as you take those platoons and eventually those companies and battalions, and hopefully we'll come out of the, the fiscal crisis by, by then. Um, so we like to call it complex and uncertain, you know, very dangerous, unpredictable, to the point where I hear it every day. And you think, geez, it's starting to not mean anything, right? But it does. I mean, it, it, it means an awful lot. So when I came in the military, we were in the middle of the Cold War, right? 1987, the Cold War. It was a bipolar world. As General Cody said, I taught in the Department of Social Sciences, so I love international relations theory. Who loves international relations theory? One, two, three. Okay, well, <laughs> good for you. Um, it does kind of give you an underpinning for some of the problems that you see, why states do what they do, why we fight, why, some, why there's sometimes why there's peace. Well, when I came in, it was a bipolar world. And we, looking back, we know that was very stable and very predictable. So as an MP, I picked to go to Germany because that's where, if we were going to fight, it's going to be there first. Now, an MP is as close as a woman could get to combat. That's what I wanted to do. But it was very predictable. We trained a lot, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, that is not, that is not your world. Right now, it is so uncertain that we don't even, there's not even a common agreement among think tanks and acad academics whether the world, for the first time ever, is more or less dangerous than it has been in the past. Usually there's some sort of agreement about that. Some people say, well, actually, it's a world of opportunity. Oh, no, 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 it's, it's a world of threat, it's highly dangerous, there's a, there's a, you know, and it's our job to find danger under every rock and around every tree, right? So, it is, by, no matter what, how you want to characterize it, it's certainly uncertain. You do not know what you're going to be doing, you know, next week. Something is, we could be in Syria tomorrow, right? North Korea, you know, we don't know. Is there an existential threat to the United States? Probably not. So we kind of bemoan the fact that there's no national security strategy, really. But maybe that's a good thing, because when you develop a strategy, you tend to find an enemy. We don't really need one. We'll deal with an unpredictable, uncertain world, right? We have enough adversaries out there who would do us harm. So um, 
I think your round tables, you're going to talk about a lot of this. The Pacific Rim, Pakistan, transnational threats, um, cyber terrorism, you know, all those things you're going to be faced. But there's also opportunities, right? Opportunities to strengthen the joint world. Um, there's opportunities to renew our profession now. Um, so anyway, that's enough. I mean, you get the idea about, and I think General Cody took you around the world today and talked about in some little bit of detail about some of those threats that you'll be facing. So the fiscal environment, you won't really know the difference, right? When you go, it'll just be with the army that you know. For, for, but your soldiers, however, will know. And even though the country was in you know, the worst economic position that, that we've been in since, since really the, the Great Depression, the military didn't feel it. We didn't feel it. For 12 years, we were, we were pretty, we were pretty um, fat. Um, I would say dumb and happy, but a lot of people were not happy. It was a very busy, very challenging time. Um, but you'll, so you'll be confronted with going to units and being, getting questions like, like this one. Just the other day, um, one of our very senior leaders, as a matter of fact, I don't mind saying, I don't think he would mind saying, it's, it's the man who is in General Cody's old position. He has a son enlisted in the 101st. And he, in his leadership, was trying to convince him to become an officer. And he said, I'm not going to become an officer. You guys are cutting my tuition assistance. Okay? You guys don't care about us at all. Right? They're used to a lot of benefits, a lot of compensation. And, and General Campbell says to him, OK, well, you'll be happy to know that your tuition assistance was restored, but you will not be going to the warrior leader course. So therefore, your chances of getting promoted have just drastically decreased. Why? Because we, only, we can only operate inside a certain pool of money. We had to take somewhere from the money. The Congress told us reinstate tuition assistance. You're not going to WLC. Well, shoot, Dad, I didn't know that. So, you know, this, this is some of the things that could affect you. You know, I know the difference, but they do. And you're going to have to talk, and it's going to be a, a time where you say, you know what, this profession is about selfless service, right? And I will tell you, an E4 now makes twice as much as he did 10 years ago. It's about $60,000. Now, he was away from his family a lot. You can't compensate for that, right? You can't compensate for the danger and the hardship and multiple tours. But still, we have, to, we have to find that balance. You can't have our hand out on, on, on one side and on the other say, you know, selfless service, pat me on the back, right? You have to have these tough conversations about what, the, what it means to be in our profession, right? And the trade-offs will be real. You just heard one. So, you know, it's a fight every day to say, you know what, we, we can, you know, officers, at least we can, we can, we don't need a pay raise this year. Oh, you're going to take a pay raise. This is the hill, right? They want to be patriotic. But the trade-off is the training that you will do with your soldiers and having them ready, the most ready they can be for anything that comes at them in that uncertain world. So and this is how you have to talk to them. And they'll listen. They'll understand they're smart um, and thoughtful people. Um, so the army you're about to enter, right? That's a little bit about it. That's a fiscal environment. It's, 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 there's, a pl there's plenty of money. Right? We're, still, we're still very rich. But you will feel the training effects. Um, and it might be, um, like I said, frustrating for those who, who, who is prior service in here? OK. So uh, and uh, combat tours? Well, it's a lot of you. Oh, that's fantastic. So you might see a difference. Okay. Um, but still, you're going to love it. You're really going to love it. The best days, I think, in, in my career probably were being an MP, platoon leader, and company commander. And, you know, most fun. This is rewarding, and it's, it's challenging and interesting, but the most fun I ever had. Because you're going to fall in love with every one of those soldiers. You really are. Well, not every single one. <laughs> not everyone, right? <laughs> OK. There's a few out there. Um, but for the most part, yes. And you're going to be in awe of your NCOs. And I will say that, as I've stepped away into the strategy and policy world, probably that's a segment of the Army I really miss the most, is those smart NCOs that teach you so much. And you keep hearing that. It's true. It's really true. So still, I take the opportunity to be mentored as much as I can by these you know, senior non-commissioned officers. Um, so this is the best army, you've heard this before, I'm sure, that the world has ever seen. Never mind just America, right? The world is that you are entering the best army. But as the chief of staff likes to say, it's not the best army that there ever will be. You're going to make it better. 
I mean, and that's a fact. You really will, and that's your charge, that's your responsibility, and I think you get it, so you're top of your class, right? Um, so we don't know what the future was hold, will hold. We've got a new defense strategy lately, and recently, about a year ago. We have um, 10 mission sets we're supposed to focus on. You could predict them. Counterterrorism, deter defeat, a regional aggressor, um, humanitarian assistance, irregular warfare, counterinsurgency, that you, that you could probably list them. There's sort of the, there's kind of no-brainers. These are the things you have to be ready to do. But what it means to the Army is that no longer was the focus going to be exclusively on CENTCOM or on counterinsurgency. So people like to say you're expected to do more with less, because we're definitely coming down, right? We're coming down from 560 to 490 in the next five years or so. Um, I, I don't think that's really true. Um, it's not really more uh, with less. Um, it's a broader spectrum of operations that you, you certainly have to do. Um, the Army is absolutely committed to uh, refining those combined arms maneuver skills. You know, the people say that an artilleryman hasn't pulled a line. He's a major, he's never pulled a line. You know, it's true. Those stories are out there. So combined arms maneuver at the brigade level will be part of your world, almost for sure. But hanging on to those wide area security skills, those war among the people, conflict among the people skills, will also be part of your world. We're committed to that as well, not to have to relearn those lessons of, of you know, both Vietnam and now it's going to be post-Afghanistan and Iraq, right? We're committed very much to being relevant. Now, okay, now that sounds sort of silly to you, maybe, but it's, it's a very tricky time. So easily, crisis response could fall to the Marines, right? All of the shaping, right, the engagement could fall to SOCOM. But that is not the world we live in. That's all of your job, right? That global land power network, being out there, being forward present will be part of your job. So when we say relevant, we are regionally aligning the Army. That's kind of going backwards a bit. I, I'll spare you the, the history lesson. But um, what that means really is that we have committed to providing, the, fulfilling the needs of combatant commanders no matter where. The chief would say, you know, when I was the MNFI commander, I would ask the Army for a grapefruit and they'd give me an orange. You know, I want to give an orange. You know, I want to give the combatant commanders whatever they need. So scalable, squat. We always talked about brigades, right? You hear all about brigades. Still the cornerstone. But we are committed to being fully scalable squad through brigade to a JTF headquarters, JTF capable headquarters. That's a lot. That's a lot of skills and a lot of things you have to grapple with. But that's what we have to do in order to provide the capabilities to the combatant commanders. Um, but I would say that above all, um, our leadership is committed to making to leader development, to making sure that you and your soldiers and your subordinate leaders still have the best opportunities. I just said we cut, cut and warrior leader course. Hmm. Yeah. Well, you know, these are some of the trade-offs, but it will be back. It will be back as soon as we get another penny. I'm sure of it. So, so leader development and training our people, educating our people, is something that is absolutely non-negotiable to General Odierno uh, and to all of our leadership. General Smith is in that business. We're, you know, it's, it's, we will continue to invest there. Why? Because in the Army, we Right? We equip our men, and the other services tend to man their equipment. Right? So you, so it'll be three and four, you guys, there's some three and four star generals probably out there in the midst of you. Right? So your education really starts now. So that you can be a three and a, and a four star general that really serves our country well. And we're very committed to that. People's eyes on that ball. Um, there's a lot of initiatives going on right now. I won't, I won't, if you want to know about them, ask me about them later. We're putting three battalions again in brigades instead of just two, um, a lot of things like that. A lot of, but if you have any questions about where the Army is headed or how we fit in the broader defense strategy, I'm happy to take that in, in, in question and answer. Um, shift to the Asia Pacific, what does that mean for the Army, right? My opinion, no worries. We will come to our senses and not make an enemy out of China, right? The security dilemma, we don't, yeah. Um, I, I think that we will, and there's plenty of challenges and threats and opportunities out there for all of the services. So, um, so let's start to talk a little bit about you in that environment, um, in that complex, uncertain world, in an army that is really changing, broadening full spectrum ops again all over the world. Um, who do you need to be in that? 
Well, I think that you spent a lot of the last four years knowing that you have to become tactic tactically and technically competent. You have to become expert in your branch. And I mean expert, right? That, that is your number one job as a second lieutenant, is to know that, know your, your metal, know the battle drills like your soldiers do, because you are going to be in this new environment. We're going back again to where, where I grew up and some of us grew up, is you're gonna be the trainer. And it is fun. It is very fun, but you gotta know what you're doing. You, I mean, invest in that. Okay, not just you know reading about leadership and military history, you gotta do that too, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But to become absolutely expert in the basic skills that is your basic branch. You will, from this point on, broaden, but that foundation has to be set well. Right, so get the toughest schools you can get. Set your foundation well, establish your credibility, right, right off the bat. Um, and, and as you, uh, and have fun with training your, your units. It is really fun. I remember doing a 100 mile, 100 mile dismounted land nav course through the Black Forest. Probably can't do that anymore. But, you know, and, and we had to do it in, in four days. And it was fun. I mean, we had some better ass. But there's those kinds of things that, that you will once again be able to do, which we could not do. I don't know if you all remember, could not do. We were very set on programs of instruction. The, our lieutenants and captains were not really in charge of their training schedules. You will be again. That's the intention anyway. And, and that's, that's, that's really great. Um, but you have to be expert in it. Um, for this environment also, you, you, I think, to me, number one is that you have a mentally agile brain, right, as far as your intellectual capabilities. You have to be agile. So what does that mean? Well, for me, it, it means that you have to have a wide open brain. Right? You have to be ready to absorb input from everywhere, no matter who says it. Might be stupid, so you discard it, but you have to listen. Be a good listener. General Rodriguez used to say, you have two ears and one mouth, and you ought to use them in that proportion. I think that's probably a good rule. Um, you know, seek broadening opportunities, but know what you are broadening is another one of those buzzwords we use now. But know what it means for you to be broadened. If someone were to send me back to the State Department, I'd say, that's not broadening me. Not at all, right? But, if, but, if, but what I would do, if I could go to a brigade, I'd go to a brigade, right? So know what broadening means for you and seek those opportunities, step out of your comfort zone. Right? You're gonna have to, you're gonna be confronted with all kinds of challenges you didn't expect, and you're gonna have to quickly understand this, the environment. You have to be ready to absorb all kinds of information. And you really can't do that if you just, and the Army doesn't always help you with that, right? Doesn't always help you get different perspectives. We tend to line people up from base, you know, company to battalion to brigade to division, all sort of in your MOS in tactical assignments, which is, is good, it certainly has a place. But the Army won't always help you. You have to seek that out. Always ask why. Okay, I mean, there's a, I won't say always, I mean, you know, and there's times not to ask why, it's time to just do as you're told. But, but your, your habit ought to be <laughs> ask why. Right? Now, why is that? One, your soldiers will ask you, why are we doing this? I remember in Somalia, we were there on a humanitarian mission, and when the day two, we end up having to build fighting positions, and I'm running from one to the other because we can hear this mob it, 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 it coming toward us. And, and I had one, and I'm running from, from fighting position to fighting position, and, and um, so one of my, who I thought was an absolute superstar, and he turned out to be, but thought we were there on a humanitarian mission, didn't understand where this was coming from. And he's like, I don't understand, ma'am. And I actually had to grab him and say, we'll talk about it later, <laughs> right? Like, but your soldiers need you. So and he did, and he stepped right too. But, but I mean, just listen, learn from me. They will want to know why. And you need to know why, because no one's going to be there to tell you every step of the way. It helps you understand your commander's intent, so you can ask him. It helps everybody clarify what you have to do and in ambiguous situations. It helps you question assumptions. Why? Well, we've always done it that way. No, 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 no. It really doesn't work so well. You have to ask why. I, I, I really believe that. You have, to, you have to be a red teamer. Does everybody know what red teaming is? Right, we actually have a school, red teaming. It helps, you, it helps you understand the opposing view and the arguments you're gonna get for, for your stated position. It's really valuable. So, I mean, be that guy. You know, read, if you don't, if you believe something, read the opposite. Strengthens your argument and you might learn something. It might change your mind just a bit. Okay. 
build teams, and by teams, I mean first and foremost, you're part of a combined arms maneuver team. So you may be an infantryman, you, you may be an armor officer, an MP, a logistician, whatever you are, you are part of a combined arms maneuver team, and it does take all of us. It really takes all of us. It's great, it's great to have pride in your branch, and you should. And you, you definitely should. But you ought to, ought to be very respectful and acknowledgement of everybody. So we, right now, in a, fiscal, in a tough fiscal environment, the tribes come out, right? There's the light fighters, and there's the heavy guys, and you're not touching one of my, my armor brigades, and you're not touching one of my airborne brigades. And those, those combat aviation units, definitely not touching them, sir. Not a single one. Okay. <laughs> But you know, it, it's when you're part of that team, you have to understand that there are, there are trade-offs, and everybody is really, um, re really required and to be respectful of that. It, it, you know, it reminds me of it, you know, so these teams that you build, um, it's kind of easier to build a team when you're in a position of command, whether that's platoon command, company command. It's my opinion. You can tell people what to do. You won't always be that. You will quickly find yourself after one or two years of the platoon, you're on a staff. You're going to have to work with that intel person and that logistician, and you're going to have to build teams that way. And it's all about persuasion, the power of your argument, your intellect, understanding their point of view, and pulling it all together. And the faster you learn that to reject parochialism, I think the better off you will be. Um, you know, when General Rodriguez asked me to be his executive officer, I said, sir, I don't think you want me. I think you could, you're thinking about some other field somewhere. It doesn't look anything like me. And don't you want a post-brigade command Infantryman? And I'll never forget it. And he said, well, why would I want that? That's what I am. So, and I had done governance stuff in Afghanistan for part of the time. So I thought that that was a pretty powerful statement and it took a lot of personal courage. Um, so personal courage, right? Sometimes it's really hard. When you question assumptions and you come at things from the opposing, you might see things other people don't see. You might. Um, do your homework, get your ducks in a row, trust your instincts, but verify them. And then speak up when you have to, right? And I'll tell you, and, and I, I thought about not telling this little, this quick little story, but I, you know, I will, I was just, a, I, was a, I was only a colonel promotable. And I was at the, at the table uh, recently, and it was, it was uh, the chief of staff of the army, and, and we were all, everybody thought that the chief had given them a directed course of action. When really what he had said was, I'm thinking out loud. But sometimes when senior leaders, your colonel says, hey, I'm thinking out loud, people says, oh, the boss said. And they run off after it, right? It's not really what the boss said, you gotta help the boss, right? That means you give him options. That means you absolutely always answer the homework assignment he gave you, but when you ask why and you question assumptions, and you do your homework and you are competent, you might wanna also, without telling him this, I learned that the hard way. Uh, without telling him that he didn't quite ask you the right question. Right? Sometimes that happens. These guys, I mean, uh, your colonel will have this much on his plate, and sometimes he's thinking fast. Or your captain, right? So you gotta help him, help him think. Think, think, think. Hey, don't just do. I had a boss who said, nothing makes me madder than someone who does exactly what I tell him and not one thing more. Right? I was a two-star general. I want you to think, think. Okay, having said all that, when you can put all that stuff together, personal courage, questioning assumptions, asking why, you can be a royal pain in the neck, right? And people will see you coming and they'll want to run the other way. You don't want that either, right? So you have to, you know, be measured, right? Know when you're not exactly mature or wise. And, and measure yourself, right? But if you're grounded, in your profession, you know your job, you've done your homework, you've questioned, you've asked why, you'll be okay. And I have a feeling that all of you do just that, or you wouldn't be where you are. I think you have wisdom probably beyond your years, and you're mature probably beyond your years. Um, and good for you, just keep it up, grow, think, master your profession, and you'll be fine, better than fine, in serving our army and our fantastic soldiers and in really what is a, a very uncertain world where you don't know what's coming at you. So with that, I will take your questions.